Hello and welcome to my presentation today. My name is Sophie. I'm a third year undergraduate biology student at the University of Reading and I'm going to be teaching you about fungi today. So first of all, thank you so much for watching this presentation. It should only take about 15 minutes to do, but I really appreciate your um, participation. So let's get started. Here are the learning objectives for today. By the end of this presentation, you should be able to state what a fungi is, describe the structure of different fungi, explain the uses of different fungi, and compare the symptoms of different fungal diseases. So our first question, what is a fungus? A fungus is an organism which is either a mushroom, a mould or a yeast. And we've got some example pictures below. Um, first, we've got the button mushroom, which you might have eaten before if you like to eat mushrooms. Then we've got black mould, which you might have seen growing um, in buildings where it's quite damp. And then on the bottom, we've got baker's yeast, which is used to make bread. And it comes in all different forms that you can see there, from the dried powder yeast to that cheese looking block, which is also yeast. And then the liquid form, um, which is called starter in the back. Those are all used for the, the same purpose to make bread. So now we're going to look at the cell structure of fungi. So fungi actually belong to a group of organisms called eukaryotes. Um, and this includes fungi, plants and animal cells. because They all have a similar cell structure, which includes a nucleus, as you can see in green, which holds all of the DNA, which controls the cell and everything that it does. We then have a cell membrane, which holds all the cell together. It's that, um, it's that outer shell which holds all of the cell parts inside. And then we also have a cytoplasm, which is a, a gel liquid, which holds everything in the cell, inside the cell. Bacteria are not part of this group of eukaryotes. They are actually in their own group called prokaryotes because they don't have this nucleus with the DNA in it. Their DNA is just in the cytoplasm, so they're not part of this group. So now we're going to look at the different types of fungi structure you might see. So we'll start with our yeast cell, which we saw an example of this earlier with our baker's yeast. There's a couple of different parts that we need to look at that are new. We've got a cell wall to start with. Um, so this is made of a chemical called chitin, and this just makes the cell super strong and protects the cell. So it's another layer around that cell membrane that just reinforces the strength of the cell. We've got our nucleus, which um, holds our DNA, which controls the cell and everything it needs to do. We've got our cytoplasm, which holds all of the cell parts. And now we've got our mitochondria. And this cell part produces energy for the cell. So it allows the cell to do everything it needs to do, which requires energy. So this might be things like reproduction. And this energy is produced in a chemical called ATP. So our next structure we have is our mould, where we saw our black mould from earlier. One thing you might notice between the yeast and the mould cells is that the, the number of cells that is in them is different. So the mould cell has lots of little cells in it and the yeast cell has only one cell. It survives as only one cell. So we would call the yeast unicellular because it only has one cell and the mould multicellular because it has multiple cells. Um, but the, stru the structure inside the cell is the same. We've got our nucleus, we've got our mitochondria, our cell membrane and our cell wall, everything is there and our cytoplasm as well. Everything there is, is it's the same um, cell parts in both structures. And then finally, we have our mushroom, which is very, very similar to our mold structure. But the only difference is that in the mushroom, some of the, some of the, um, fungal cells grow under the ground and some of them grow above the ground. And the part that we normally eat 
is the above ground part. In moulds, they would typically just grow above the ground. Next, we're going to look at the uses of fungi. Um, and the main use you might be able to think of is as food. There are several species of mushroom which are edible, such as the button mushroom, the shiitake mushroom. There's other ones such as the portobello mushroom. Um, you don't typically eat mould or yeast by themselves. We normally use them in other food components, um, such as in the production of bread or cheese. Um, so for bread, we've got our baker's yeast, the yeast that we use to make it rise and give it that um, give it that specific texture that bread has. And some cheese, such as um, those really smelly cheeses, we've got that Stilton. Um, we've got a picture of Stilton in the corner there, and that has um, mould in it, which gives it that distinct flavour. So you can see those those little green parts in the middle. That's mould. And we also use yeast in the production of alcohol. So we start with sugar, you add your yeast to it, it produces CO2, and then at the end we produce alcohol. And that's a process called fermentation. Here are some more uses of fungi. So first we've got use as a traditional medicine, such as the almond mushroom, which is used as a cancer treatment in Chinese traditional medicine. The thing to be aware of is that sometimes there isn't evidence to support these treatments, where research has actually shown that the almond mushroom, instead of preventing cancer, might actually give you cancer. So it's definitely something to consider when we're talking about these sorts of medicines. We also see fungi in modern medicine, such as penicillin, which you might have heard of. This was actually discovered um, as a bread mould. It, it grows when your bread goes mouldy. Um, it produces penicillin, that, that specific um, species of mould. Um, and this is used to treat a range of bacterial infections, including pneumonia, meningitis, um, ear infections. There's a whole range of, of um, different diseases which we treat with penicillin. They're always bacterial infections. We also can use fungi as a pest control. So if you grow specific species of mushrooms, you can discourage certain insects such as grasshoppers from eating away at your plants or your crops if you're, if you're a farmer which is really useful for us and it saves us a lot of time and money. There is also some research on the use of fungi at reducing pollution. Because um, one thing mushrooms specifically are good for is taking in the, the chemicals around them and breaking them down into natural elements. And we see this um, especially with metal. So lead is, um, is a common pollutant, which um, which the mushroom will take it in and um, reduce its, its pollution effects. And finally, we're going to be looking at fungal diseases. So some fungi have the ability to produce toxins known as mycotoxins. And these toxins are what make um, a lot of fungi species dangerous to humans if you end up ingesting um, something like a poisonous mushroom um, and these toxins get produced inside your body they can make you quite ill and um, quite sick and they sometimes can even kill you um, it's not ideal for your body um, and these mycotoxins work by breaking down the cell membrane of cells so this can happen to both plant and animal cells depending on the different species so here are a list of human fungal infections. So first we've got thrush. This is a fungal infection of the tongue. It can also um, affect the genital area as well. Um, this can be often quite itchy, quite uncomfortable. Um, and then we have athlete's foot, which is um, a fungal infection of the feet. When they become quite sweaty and quite warm, you get this fungi growing. 
and it can again be quite itchy quite uncomfortable it might even break the skin but both thrush and athlete's foot can be treated quite easily with um with creams or with um antifungal pills that you can swallow um and they're not typically um life-threatening and the symptoms they they range but they're not typically um too uncomfortable and then our final fungal infection is an infection called aspergillosis and this is a fungal infection of the lungs um, and this can cause things like coughing um, can give you a bit of a fever um, and it's slightly different to thrush and athlete's foot which only affects sort of the outer layer of the body, such as the, the you know, the skin, the tongue, areas like that. This is thrush and athlete's foot are what we would call superficial infections because they happen on that outside layer of the body. For aspergillosis, it starts off as a superficial infection, that outside layer of the, of the lungs. And if it's not treated, it can spread and uh, make its way into the blood and travel to other organs and cause things like organ failure in the organs it manages to get into. This is what we would call a um, invasive infection when it's able to spread within the body, different parts of the body. Um, and it's typically, um, it's a more serious infection. It can, it can be life-threatening if it's not treated in time. You can use, <coughs> sorry, um, antifungal pills again, um, creams obviously is not an option for these types of infections, um, but it's sort of a case by case basis that you would treat these sorts of infections. So in summary, we have been able to state what a fungus is. Um, a eukaryote, which is either a yeast, mould or mushroom. We have also been able to describe the structure of fungi, so the different cell parts, including the nucleus, cell membrane, cytoplasm, cell wall, mitochondria in both the yeast and mould structures. We have been able to explain the uses of fungi in foods, drinks, medicines, everything beyond. And we have also compared the symptoms of different fungal diseases. Um, and their treatments and the difference between a superficial and invasive infection.